want to talk about the HIV issues and how, what there was in messaging here that may have changed the way you might consider treatment today. Well, I think one of the most important studies was from the NA Accord, uh, which is this large conglomerate of databases, uh, observational databases in U.S. and Canada, looking at the question of when to start therapy. And they really did something uh, unique uh, that we haven't seen in um, an observational study before, where they really <coughs> compared people who, who start early, that is, uh, with a CD4 between 350 and 500, and compared it to people who don't do that and who wait and found a 70% reduction in, in uh, or 70% improvement in survival with the earlier approach. Um, they intend to go further and look at uh, starting above 500 and hopefully we'll present that soon. Um, I think that this is, is one of the most important uh, observational studies about when to start. We all know that if, if we had the perfect drug the perfect treatment, we would treat HIV from the moment it was diagnosed. Mm -hmm. You know, what other infectious disease do we, do we, uh, you know, have a treatment for, but we don't treat it until it gets to a certain degree of, uh, of advanced, uh, you know, advanced state. So, so the only reason we don't do that is, is, besides cost, of course, is that the drugs aren't perfect, but they're sure mm -hmm. getting a lot better. And I think the, the risk-benefit ratio is changing, supporting early therapy. I think the other thing that becomes clear from this study and many others is that <clears throat> we focused for too long on immunosuppression as the big problem with HIV. <clears throat> Excuse me. And while it certainly is a big problem, uh, we're now realizing that it's not the only problem. It's not all about CD4, that there are things that happen mm -hmm. to you because of untreated HIV that, mm -hmm. that we wouldn't have previously thought of as being HIV related. Heart attacks and uh, kidney disease and, and uh, lipid changes and bone changes and changes in the brain. Um, these are all things that, uh, or many of them, are things that we may be able to help prevent through treatment. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and we can't just focus on pneumocystis and toxo and, and CMV mm -hmm. the way we did before. Well, I, I have to say, if you're talking about treatment experience patients, raltegravir is just I call it the free space on the bingo card. You know, I mean, it, everybody's susceptible to it. It mm -hmm. works. You're not going to have to do any special tests. And almost everybody right, right, who's right. in that treatment experience category is going to get raltegravir. The question is not, should I use raltegravir? The question is, what are you going to combine it with to protect it against resistance? Right. And there, you, you know, you've got uh, darunavir, you've got etrovirine, you've got maraviroc. And, and in some fortunate patients, they, they have more, of those, more drugs than they actually need. And the question is, which one do I not use? Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> I think that I've been very impressed with Maraviroc in terms of how well tolerated it is. Um, and the real problem with Maraviroc has not been with the drug, but with the need to do tropism testing. Mm -hmm. and now, one of those problems is the cost and the, the hassle factor, and that hasn't gone mm -hmm. away. But, but one of the other concerns was about the sensitivity of the test and that you could miss dual mixed or X4 virus that was present at low levels and therefore give patients Maraviroc who wouldn't benefit from it. Mm -hmm. And I think the new tropism assay has really alleviated that concern because it, mm -hmm. it's very sensitive. And now when I order a, a tropism test, if it says R5, I'm pretty confident that that's R5. And so that's given me a lot more confidence in using Maraviroc with Raltegravir mm -hmm. in that patient population. And then, you know, you, then you're often looking for a third drug. Um, uh, it may be Maraviroc, it may be Etrovirine, it may be Darunavir, and that's going to depend on your assessment mm -hmm. of, of PI resistance, non nuke mm -hmm. resistance, things like that. Um, how, how, with people, a lot of people have been, uh, how can I say it, um, been on suppressive regimens for a long time and they have to go back in history to find where there might be a sense of what they're really resistant to. Do you, do you really rely on that a lot? I guess you have to, there, if there's no other choice to, to do another test and you don't like to get people to where their, uh, their viral load jacks way up before you treat, how do you kind of like, handle that. Yeah, well, uh, historical resistance tests are critical, and, it, and it, it, uh, uh, it's so important to, to mm -hmm. keep those old resistance tests, to keep the mm -hmm. data somehow in a cumulative fashion. And um, um, I kind of wish resistance testing companies would do that for you, that they would tell you, okay, yes. here's your resistance yeah. mutations, here's the ones you previously had. Well, that would be really helpful, but in, in the absence of that, the, we have to be doing it, and it becomes a problem when patients transfer care from one place to another yes. and the records don't follow them uh, because that kind of historical information is critical. Mm -hmm. If you can't get that, the best you can do is use a current resistance test and then try to infer 
uh, resistance based on their treatment history, but that often is it's also hard well. to get. Yeah. I would point out that this is, this is one place where the tropism test is particularly useful. Someone comes into me, hasn't been on treatment for three years, last time they were on treatment was in a prison, or their doctor who retired and his records are in storage. I'm never gonna get the resistance test, but yeah. I know if I, if I order a resistance test today, it may be wrong, but if I order a tropism test, it's gonna tell me the tropism. So mm -hmm. that's a situation where I might have more confidence, for example, in Maraviroc than I might in, in some of the other drugs where I, because I don't have good resistance data. Mm -hmm. You don't have that background. Was there anything else that, that might have uh, uh, changed your mind on, on something at the conference that, that uh, as far as treating? I know that you, you tend to, being who you are, you know, you know more things before they actually happen, but I know a lot of doctors are here first time hearing something and, and they're kind of aware of a, a shift in thinking. Well, this, this isn't something that changed my mind so much as, as sort of uh, confirmed what I expected would happen, and that mm -hmm. is the, the data from the Startmark study, which was the raltegravir versus efavirenz. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'd seen phase two data suggesting that raltegravir was gonna look good in treatment naive patients. Mm -hmm. This was a phase three trial that confirmed that. It showed that raltegravir uh, as a first-line therapy was not inferior to efavirenz, and as you might expect, better tolerated because it didn't have mm -hmm. the, right, the, the CNS side effects. Yeah. So I think that um, this conference and that study now expand our choices for first-line therapy so that it's, it, you can use two nukes plus a non-nuke, you can use two, two nukes plus a boosted PI, or you can use two nukes plus mm -hmm. raltegravir. Um, and all of those are gonna be good mm -hmm. choices and the question of you know how we're gonna make decisions mm -hmm. isn't quite decided yet, but, but certainly mm -hmm. issues of once versus twice daily dosing, uh, side effect mm -hmm. issues, pill burden, that kind of thing will all come into play. Uh, I, I, a lot of people look up to you for who you are and what you've known and what you've learned over the years and the way you've deployed your, your resistance issues. And I, I think the question that I would ask you is to, uh, to make a statement regarding the importance of making a good optimized regimen which people may last for years on and thinking, of, thinking in those terms. <coughs> Don't think about this, oh, well, if this doesn't work, we'll try something. Can you, uh, I mean, do you feel, first of all, do you feel that way? And second of all, do you want to? Yeah, Nail that. <laughs> absolutely. I mean, I mean, Bob Silicano didn't he didn't present these data, but he discussed them in one of his um, uh, summary talks about the fact that if you when when we took people at our at our clinic who were on um, a tripla and used a, a one copy assay to look at their viral loads, you know, maybe their viral loads were five or ten or something like that. But when you added an, a protease inhibitor, it didn't make a, a difference, any difference in their viral load, meaning that that viral load is not replicating virus. It's, it's just mm -hmm. virus being released from latent CD4, resting CD4 cells. What that's telling you is that when you're on an effective regimen, there's no replication, there's no mutation. That means that these drugs could last forever, as you point out. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. there's, no, there's no clock ticking once you start these, ther these treatments. So the, the, the thing that matters is was the, was the regimen chosen well and is the patient taking the regimen? You, if those two are, if the answer to those two questions is yes, these can go on indefinitely. And the only reason you would end up changing was just because something better came along or you had side effects. So mm -hmm. I'm very, very positive about the durability of the regimens we're using today. And I think it just, uh, it stresses the importance of, of making sure if you're a, if you're a you're clinician get there. that you, 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 you do baseline <laughs> resistance testing, talk to the patient about adherence, follow the guidelines and use use preferred regimens, and I think we'll have great results.